You know, I've been around for a while. I've met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you'd think that there wasn't much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer, and others just defy logic. Are curses real? In Britain, a mysterious painting is blamed for a string of deadly house fires. But the one link between them all is the crying boy. Is it the work of a supernatural arsonist? In Florida, a sinister doll ruins the lives of anyone who crosses it. Fear. A lot of fear. Can a child's toy possess the power to destroy? And in California, a wealthy heiress embarks on the most bizarre construction job in history. The spirits were coming back to get their vengeance on her. Is she driven by a deadly family curse? Yeah, it's a weird world, and I love it. Do you believe in superstition and bad luck? Most of us do. And I don't believe the usual stuff like broken mirrors, or black cats, or, or walking under ladders. We all know about those. But did you know there's literally thousands of things that can bring you misfortune, like uh, number 13? In Japan, it's uh, number four. In Italy, it's a 17. And in Australia, it's number 87. And did you also know? Oh, no. It's bad luck to kill a ladybug. And there's more. Oh, oh, hey, hey, don't, don't do, don't do that. Never play shoes on a table. You'll have bad luck for the rest of the day. And, uh, and, and, and dropping a pair of scissors is a warning that a lover is unfaithful. Is it really possible? Can our lives be altered for the worse by inanimate objects? Can we be truly cursed by things beyond our control? Whoa. Whoa, thank goodness. She's faithful. 1985, Rotherham, England. A devastating house fire destroys the home of Ron and Mary Hall. They had lived in their rather nice terraced home in Rotherham for 27 years. The story was investigated by Kelvin McKenzie, former editor of The Sun, Britain's highest selling newspaper. There had been a fire in this terraced house, a chip pan fire. It burned down most of the house. But this is no ordinary blaze. Firefighters make a bizarre discovery in the ruins. There was a picture, an artist's picture of a crying boy. And despite everything else going up in flames, it survived. How could a painting be immune to fire? As he works on the story, Mackenzie makes a startling discovery. This is no isolated incident. Firefighters have come across the crying boy before, in the ruins of dozens of destroyed homes. There was a fire officer in the Rotherham area who claimed to have logged 50 separate examples of houses which had the crying boy on the wall having some kind of fire. The more the editor learns, the stranger the story becomes. The crying boy was painted in Madrid in 1969 by a little-known Spanish artist, Bruno Amadio. Cheap reproductions were sold widely in Britain during the 1960s and 70s. But the house fires are the first time it's been linked to tragedy. There's a sense that out there, there is 
the curse of the crying boy. Mackenzie isn't prepared for the reaction. The paper is inundated with stories of the crying boy. Mrs. Jones says her place burnt down in Cornwall. The White family in Harrogate in Yorkshire, their place went. I was absolutely gobsmacked, to be truthful, at the huge avalanche of stuff that started coming our way. These new stories raise an alarming possibility. The crying boy isn't just surviving fires. It's starting. The one link between them all was the crying boy. As fear grows over the threat posed by the picture, Mackenzie launches a campaign to destroy every last copy of it. Save your house. Send us that crying boy art, and we will destroy it for you before it destroys you. We were literally swamped by it. So we then took all the work, we stuck it up together, made a bonfire, lit it, up it all goes. And that way, we'd actually taken away the curse from them. The reality was that because there was no email and because the old snail mail, people couldn't be bothered to do it, actually, they were swamping uh, the newspaper. And actually, funnily enough, because this ha had happened somewhere at the thick end of 25 years ago now, were the crying boys and the fires to happen today, this would be a massive worldwide story because people uh, would pick up on it around the world. The crying boys, there would suddenly be fires in the Philippines uh, and, in, and, in, and in Vietnam and in lots of other ways. It would have rippled out a lot more, but it stayed very narrowly within the sort of Rotherham Wigan area for some inexplicable reason. The Curse of the Crying Boy is one of the strangest stories Mackenzie's encountered in 40 years as a journalist. That kind of story is a story which everybody will read because everybody has a feeling about curses and walking under ladders and, and, and what happens is 25 years later, we're still talking about it. Is the curse real? Can a painting actually cause house fires? This is the stuff of nightmares, isn't it? I mean, you hang a painting in your house, and the next thing you know, it's burned to the ground. Could a painting have power? It's weird. Or what? But what I want to know is, who is this boy? And why is he so sad? Can anyone smell something? Oberon Zell is the co-founder of the Church of All Worlds. I would say that the curse of the crying boy is a really genuine modern curse. Zell is not only sure that curses exist, but that they take different forms. The curse of the crying boy is what we call an object curse. That's a curse that is associated with a material object of some sort, as opposed to one that's put out upon a person or a family. According to Zell, some of history's most infamous hexes were actually object curses. You know, the curse of the mummy's tomb. These are the kind of things which don't involve somebody deliberately laying a spell. But misfortune is associated with them. But if the crying boy is an object of misfortune, where did the evil come from? Everything that we are, everything we do, everything we think is stories. So the stories themselves is what has the power. The curse is embedded in the story that's told about it. And the belief in that story and the repeating of that story is what has given the curse its power. Huge numbers of people know about this curse and believe in it, and that gives it an enormous amount of power. A curse, like a blessing, is a story, and the story acquires its power depending on how many people uh, embrace it and believe in it and hold to it. The curse of the crying boy has acquired an enormous amount of power because it's become a legend that people believe in, and the more people believe in it, the stronger it gets. If one person believes in a curse, like the curse of the crying boy, then you could say they're just a nut job. But when it comes to where hundreds of thousands of people believe in it, then it acquires enormous amount of power, and it shapes the world as much as it is shaped. For Zell, it's simple. We need look no further than the boy who is staring out at us. But who was he? And why was he crying? He had been an orphan whose parents had died in a fire, and that's why he was sad and, and struck dumb. 
Living in Madrid in 1969, the mute and homeless boy was found wandering the streets by the artist, who was so struck by his grief he decided to paint him. Just a few days later, his studio mysteriously burned down. He accused the child of having started the fire, and the child fled. Why would a mute child commit arson? Zell's explanation, because he was a fire starter. A fire starter is someone who has a pyrotechnic ability to create fires. Not necessarily intentionally, although that may be too, but it's a psychic phenomenon like telepathy and clairvoyance and such. But it can never be proved. Tragically, the orphan boy was apparently killed in a car accident years later. But some believe his ability to start fires with his mind lived on in the painting. The child was cursed. Wherever his picture appeared, fires would break out. Could the crying boy be the carrier of an object curse? And is the fact that I'm talking about it actually making the problem worse? Or could there be a rational explanation? The story of the crying boy is real. In Britain, dozens of house fires are linked to a mysterious painting that survives the flames. Is the crying boy cursed? Mechanical engineer Michael Goliner studies fire and combustion at the University of California, San Diego. I don't believe it's a curse on the painting that's causing it not to burn. In Goliner's thinking, the idea a painting could survive a house fire isn't strange. It depends on what stage of a fire that room got to. And it depends on what was burning, at what time the fire brigade got in. There doesn't have to be any sort of curse. The critical factor, says Goliner, isn't what's in the picture but what it's made of. The crying boy painting is probably made of some kind of hardboard or dense particle board. It's the hardboard that it's painted on that's causing it not to burn in a full room fire. According to Golner, particle board is almost fireproof, unlike the rest of the contents of a typical home. Say you have a large fire growing. It's very hot and all the gases in the room, all the materials will flash and ignite. That crying boy painting is painted on a material that's much harder to ignite than things around it so it could definitely survive a room fire. Another factor that could have helped the painting escape the flames is the way it's mounted. Golder thinks if the crying boy is hung with ordinary string, the painting will fall down as the string burns off, and that's what saves it. What's gonna happen is that it won't ignite on the floor. We have all that cool air which is gonna blow in on the bottom, so you know it's gonna be really hard to ignite. But how does Golner explain the dozens of house fires linked to the crying boy? Simple. It's a coincidence. The probability of a crying boy painting, which was maybe reproduced 50,000 times, and house fires, which happen every day throughout all of England, of those colliding and happening is very likely. I wouldn't be afraid of having this painting in my home. There's no curse on it. It's all a matter of the materials and the fire that's occurring. What's really important, though, is that it just wouldn't look good in my house. To prove his theory, Golner has set up an experiment. We have gas flow. For the first time, he hopes to reveal what happens to the painting during a blaze. We're going to simulate what a room fire in a typical Yorkshire townhouse would have been. I'm excited. We're going to have a pretty big fire going here. It's going to get very hot in there. For sure, we're going to ignite most of the items in that room. The temperature inside the room quickly rises to almost 1,100 degrees Celsius. Even firefighters in full gear couldn't survive there. Suddenly something happens that seems to confirm Palmer's theory. The crying boy falls to the ground. Looks like there was so much air current, blowing air through here, that it looks like it actually blew the painting off of the wall and off of the hook that was made for it. It's exactly as Goller predicted. By falling to the floor, the painting is now in the coolest part of the room. If the painting was on the wall, it most likely would have ignited. Goldner is convinced the experiment proves the fears around the painting are groundless. The story of the crying boy is real, and that people had these paintings on their walls, and some of them survived the fire. The curse is just a fabrication, or really it's just people's imaginations running wild trying to describe a behavior that happens everywhere. Not every fire flashes over. If the fire brigade gets there in time, the fire's out and the painting's safe. You saw that painting last a very long time. So really, depends on the fire, depends on the painting, depends on where you place it.
Investigative journalist Chris Horry agrees. He's convinced the crying boy story was fabricated from the start. It exploits an element of ignorance and an element of superstition, two big parts of the tabloid package, it has to be said. Horry has a surprising explanation for the uproar around the picture. He thinks it was a salvo in a growing circulation war between Britain's two largest newspapers. There were two tabloids here. One was The Sun, the other one was The Mirror. The Mirror was more old-fashioned. Then along comes The Curse of the Crying Boy. This was absolutely meat and drink to The Sun. Horry believes the son jumped on the crying boy story and ran with it. The editor, Kelvin McKenzie, is known as a kind of genius of the tabloid arts. He'd worked out that this was the biggest selling painting, so a million people had it or whatever on their wall. So if he wrote about that, there's a million potential customers. McKenzie's masterstroke, according to Horry, was his offer for readers to send their paintings to the paper. People could send in their crying boy picture and have it safely disposed of, as though it was asbestos or nuclear waste or something like that, that you couldn't simply put in the bin yourself. Well, this was a hallmark of the sun in those days. It didn't simply report the news, wanted to be part of the story whenever possible. And see, it is part of the story. Even now, we're still talking about it. So it was a walking story. It had legs. It would run and run and run. And it was a talking story. Everybody was talking about it. So it was absolutely perfect. And it turned into a, a, a sun crusade against the crying boy, as though the painting had some kind of evil force in it, with the sun claiming the credit for saving the population of Britain from this inexplicable curse. Absolutely genius, brilliant tabloid journalism. Do I believe in the curse of the crying boy? The answer to that is I do. I believe in curses generally. I believe in bad luck generally. I'd never go under a ladder. And if you if you, uh, you ask anybody, they will avoid certain things and doing certain things. Somebody brought to me a piece of art of the crying boy about a year ago. And do you know what? I refused to have it in the house. They wanted basically to present it to me. I wouldn't have it. And we, we carried on talking, but I insisted that it stayed in the porch. And so, so that's 25 years ago. I don't want that piece of work in my house. We definitely didn't make it up to sell papers. So was the curse of the crying boy a media creation? Did the paintings have supernatural powers? Or was it just a series of strange coincidences? Weird. In Florida, a woman's life falls apart after a bizarre encounter with a toy. Can a children's doll bear a curse? It scares a lot of people, including me. You know, one of the great things about being a grandfather is being able to watch my grandkids play, especially with their imaginary friends, but we all did it, right? I mean, we think guys like this are real, and we give them personalities and names and presents, and we give them real love, and they love us in return. Yeah. But did you ever have an imaginary friend who wasn't quite so friendly? One that scared you out of your wits? Meet Robert. April 2007, Key West, Florida. 52-year-old Heather Clement visits the East Martello Museum. I was wandering around the museum, and I was just on my cell phone, like I always am. Uh -huh. And I went upstairs to the top of the building and kind of checked it out, because it's beautiful up there. Continued to talk on my phone, wandered downstairs, and walked out the door. But what began as a pleasurable day out soon turns into anything but. Weird things started happening, one at a time that I didn't really pay attention to. In the days that follow, Heather suffers an inexplicable string of setbacks in every part of her life. My boyfriend and I breaking up, my car breaking down, and I can't explain that. And then I lost a job, the job that I came down here for. Heather gets a new job, but her workplace burns to the ground, and her run of bad luck doesn't end there. I had a date, and I don't hear from the guy. 
and I finally get a text that says, sorry, been in the hospital, got hit by a car. She begins to suspect it's more than chance or coincidence. It was pretty frightening, because I mean, nothing that I did was right. Alarmed, Heather decides to seek help. She consults a psychic. What she learns chills her to the bone. She's been cursed. There were a lot of emotions that went through me. Uh, disbelief, absolute disbelief, fear, a lot of fear. I didn't believe in any curses. I didn't believe in anything like that. Who or what would want to curse Heather? The psychic tells her a 100-year-old exhibit at the East Martello Museum called Robert the Doll. I knew all about Robert before I went there. I'd read about him. And he's in a lot of stories. Robert the Doll is a three-foot doll, and he is enchanted. He gets blamed for a lot of things in Key West. Incredibly, hundreds of others also claim to have suffered extreme bad luck after visiting Robert the Doll. Could a toy really invoke a curse? And why would it strike Heather? I start looking back and going, maybe it is Robert. Then she remembers. And I kind of blew past him. She walked right past the doll's display case. I believe that Robert the doll cursed me because I ignored him. I just blew past him on my cell phone, not giving him respect. Can a child's plaything really possess evil powers? I'm convinced that Robert is more than just a doll. David Sloan is a paranormal investigator. He thinks the key to this mystery began in 1904, when a servant of a prominent Key West couple was fired. What we do know is that the servant felt wronged. In a bizarre act of revenge, the servant created an effigy of the couple's young son, Eugene, and then gave it to him as a gift. He looked like a small child. He stood about three feet tall. He's stuffed with straw, little black buttons for eyes, and he's dressed in a cute little sailor suit. From the beginning, Eugene Otto's love for the doll is unusually intense. Robert and Eugene were inseparable from the moment Robert arrived in the house. Soon Eugene's parents notice their son is behaving strangely around the doll. They overhear Eugene having conversations, chillingly, there's not one voice, but two. Eugene's behavior then becomes more erratic and violent. He claims Robert is somehow making him do it. His response was always, I didn't do it, Robert. Soon, word spreads of weird events at the Otto's home. Local kids would come by the Otto family home and they would see Robert sitting in the window of the turret room and they'd report him moving from side to side, pulling back to shade. The only time that Jean was away from Robert was when he attended an art university in France. And that is where he met his wife, Anne. She was a very accomplished concert pianist. And together they moved back to Key West and back into the auto residence. Anne was not fond of Robert. Uh, Jean spent all his time with him. He'd take him up to his studio. It was a little strange for a grown man to be playing with dolls. After Eugene's death in 1974, the house is sold. But Robert remains in the attic, and the new owners experience even more terrifying incidents. There was a plumber who was doing some work up in the attic, and he heard giggling coming from behind him. When he turned around, Robert had moved from one side of the room over to the other. And this plumber, he ran down the stairs, out of the house, never came back. Eventually, to rid him from their lives, they donate Robert to a local museum. But the weird behavior doesn't stop. It gets worse. When you visit the East Martello Museum, you will see hundreds of letters from people who have felt Robert's curse. Some of them say, I'm sorry I mocked you. Since that happened, I had a flat tire. I was struck by lightning twice. Heather Clement is just one of them. She is desperate to lift the hex that is destroying her life. 
I asked a couple of psychics, what do you do? How do you remove curses? The answer? Beg forgiveness. I wrote an apology letter to Robert. It is sealed. What is inside, it's between Robert and I, and uh, it's private. I'd like to keep it that way. Worst thing I've ever done was to disrespect Robert the Doll. Now, this is really weird, or what? A doll who gets offended by something as trivial as someone walking past him in the wrong way. What is he, some kind of dictator? And then the woman has to write him an apology? That's ridiculous. I mean, if you're going to get upset enough to curse someone, you might as well have a good reason. <laughs> How about this, Robert? <laughs> Dear Robert, I am so sorry I raspberried you just now. Please. Is Robert the Doll possessed by an evil intelligence? If so, how did he get these terrible powers? Can he genuinely curse those who cross his path? People who are cursed by Robert seem to bring it on themselves. Visitors to a Florida museum believe an exhibit is casting evil spells. Is Robert the Doll possessed by a curse? Paranormal investigator Chad Lewis has no doubt. I certainly believe Robert is cursed. Now, whether that curse is man-made with our belief systems, I don't know. Lewis says the servant who made Robert practiced hoodoo. Uh, hoodoo is a form of magic that really values conjuring and spells and hexes. It's using a lot of bones, it's using teeth, herbs, and a lot of the spells. Voodoo's a religion, hoodoo's a practice, but more specifically, Voodoo is more of a belief system in the black magic, whereas Voodoo is more conjuring, more spells, and you can be a uh, belief in Voodoo and not practice it, much like you can be a Catholic and never go to church. But with Voodoo, it's more of the practice of the, the dark arts or the magic. Lewis is also sure the servant placed a hex on the doll to retaliate for being fired. The curse was intended to do damage on not only the family, but everybody who visits him as well. But here comes the crunch. Lewis not only thinks Robert the Doll is cursed, but he's alive. When you visit Robert, you see that there's almost an, an intelligence to him. Whether it's a soul was placed in him or transferred, I don't know, but something with Robert stands out more than just your ordinary curse. Is there life behind this wooden demeanor? Lewis is convinced the secret of Robert's supernatural power is a mysterious talisman hidden inside his straw body. One of the legends is that he has a soul stone placed in him, usually a piece of uh, a different person that has passed. Once the soul stone was placed inside Robert, the hex was complete. But is he really evil? I wouldn't say I'm afraid of Robert. I'm certainly creeped out by him, and I'm on notice when I'm around Robert. But being afraid of him, I don't think uh, he'll harm me as long as I'm respectful to him. Is hoodoo real? Can anyone with the right spell and ingredients put a powerful jinx on anyone or anything? Or is there another explanation? Psychologist Dr. Marilyn Miller thinks something else is at work, and it has nothing to do with supernatural. I don't believe in curses, but I do believe in the power of the mind. The mind is so powerful that you could actually die from the fear of a curse. Miller believes Robert's evil power is simply a product of Eugene Otto's imagination. All children believe that inanimate objects and their toys have human qualities. But Eugene wasn't like most other children. He never stopped believing Robert was alive. Gene, the owner of the doll, had his own psychological issues, and perhaps he was left alone a lot with a very vivid imagination. Miller also thinks once rumors of Robert's evil nature spread, they took on a life and power of their own. Once that person believes they have been cursed, it can change the chemistry in the body. That person loses their appetite, neglects their health, and simply they feel that they are going to die. It's the human mind 
that you're seeing imposing patterns of relatedness to really unrelated events, especially if they believe that something has put a curse on them. All the things that we learned as children, um, knock on wood, salt over your shoulder, don't walk under a ladder, we believe these things. And as children, and, and many adults bring them into adulthood, um, for example, they, it gives you a sense of control. If you avoid these things or do certain things, it, it, you feel that you've increased the chances of good things happening or preventing bad things from happening. So they're very self-reinforcing. Are the many curses of Robert simply mass superstition running wild? Or is he really just a doll? How then do we explain his ability to move and manipulate his surroundings? One man thinks he knows. Andy Sway is an energy healer. He not only believes that Robert has dark powers, but we're all to blame. The story of Robert the Doll is really pretty simple. It's just a case of a lot of people putting a certain negative energy into an object, and others that are in tune with that form of negativity then can receive it when they visit. Is it possible? Could Robert be a receiver of ominous energy? If so, where does it come from? The main way that negative energy is transferred is through abuse. One person's issues are inflicted on another person. Um, so that abuse could be mental, physical, verbal, or anything. Does Robert pick up our worst thoughts and then transmit them back at us as curses and mind games? But how? And why? I think the whole Robert the Doll story is, is an example of a snowball effect. Um, Eugene tells the story that Robert the Doll caused these negative events, then the townspeople join in, and now it's internationally famous. So I just think it's snowballed. Are we to blame for the curse of Robert the Doll? Is he the product of hoodoo magic with an evil talisman hidden deep in his insides? Or is it all in our heads? We're no one. A woman embarks on one of the strangest construction projects in history. Was she driven by angry ghosts? The spirits were coming back to get their vengeance on her. You know, I've always been obsessed with DIY repairing and renovating my lovely house after all. It is my castle. Oh! Oh! Yeah, there, there's nothing like the sense of achievement and, and satisfaction you get from transforming your surroundings. Oh! Perfecting every detail of the place that you call home. Well, maybe not perfect. You know, there are some home renovations that can take over your life, but it's the ones that take over your afterlife that you really have to worry about. 1860s, USA. As pioneers fight and forge their way across America in their quest to conquer the Wild West, perhaps one invention more than any other helped them to succeed. The Winchester Rifle. Built by the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, this efficient killing machine not only decimated the Native American population, it made Wirt Winchester and his wife, Sarah, one of the wealthiest and most respected couples in the country. But for Sarah, the joy of success was short-lived. In 1866, a series of mysterious and tragic events began that would follow her to her grave. Every person who was close to Sarah Winchester inexplicably died. Her husband, brother, daughter, and father-in-law. What followed has become one of the most bizarre, unsolved mysteries in history. Paranormal investigator Mitchell Whittington wrote about the case. She had all these blows hit her just in a very short amount of time that had to be completely devastating to her. She lost, to start with, she lost a daughter. She and William had had one daughter, and little Annie passed away after only a few weeks. She then, uh, several years later, went through a 10-month period in which she lost her mother, 
her father-in-law, Mr. Winchester, which she was very close with, and then her own husband, William, died of tuberculosis. Delirious with grief, Sarah turns to the spirit world and to a medium who can help her communicate with her dead family. She went to a Boston psychic uh, whose name was Adam Coons, and he was not able to make the contact that she was looking for, but he did have an answer for her. What the psychic tells her will haunt her for the rest of her life. He told her that what she was experiencing was a curse. Even worse, she's told the curse originates with the very thing that earned the family its massive wealth. She was the sole heir to the Winchester repeating rifle fortune. And so all the spirits of all the people who had been killed in the United States uh, by the Winchester repeating rifles were coming back to get their vengeance on her. It's horrific news, but the psychic offers Sarah a ray of hope. He came up with a strategy for her that would allow her to deal with the spirits. And that strategy was to build a house. If she built a big enough house where they could hang out more or less, that they would, uh, they would stop trying to, to hurt her and her family. But there's a catch. The house can never be large enough to contain all the spirits of the dead. More and more spirits were going to be coming along because even as they were talking, more and more people were being killed by Winchester repeating rifles. Faced with this ghostly message from the netherworld, Sarah embraces a curious solution. She will simply keep building her home for as long as she lives. Sarah purchases a farm near San Jose for the construction site. She hired a uh, team of carpenters, and Sarah would actually tell them exactly where to build and what she wanted. She had a number of uh, people working there all day long, all night long. Uh, they say the hammering never stopped. Winchester House, as it comes to be known, grows apace. But Sarah's obsession with the spirit world exerts a bizarre influence on its design. She would put in odd staircases that went to nowhere. She would put in trap doors. She would put in doors that you opened up and there was a wall behind. So if the spirits were wandering around, they would get confused and they would hopefully leave her alone. Sarah becomes an eccentric recluse. She conducts nightly seances, convinced the ghosts of Winchester victims are pursuing her everywhere. She would sleep in a different bedroom every night, so the spirits would never know exactly where she was. And she would always take a different path to uh, the, the bedroom, so they would hopefully throw the spirits off. To defy the spirits, Sarah continues building. The house becomes a gothic monstrosity. 24,000 square feet with 160 rooms. And Sarah thought that the number 13 was a good number. It represented safety. So she put the number 13 throughout the house. Uh, there's 13 railings in the hallways, 13 steps on the staircase, uh, 13 cupolas in the, the greenhouse, 13 uh, lights on the chandelier. Uh, there's 13 bathrooms in the house. And the 13th bathroom has 13 windows. Uh, the room leading into it has 13 panels on the walls. And there's 13 steps leading up to it. And if you go to the sink and look in the drain, there's 13 holes in the drain. 13's everywhere you look. And this went on up until her death, when she finally died in 1922, and it was learned by the workers that Sarah had passed. They all put down their, their tools and left the property. Winchester House is still standing today, a unique memorial to almost 40 years of construction. Many believe the ghosts that haunted Sarah are still there. Was Sarah Winchester really the victim of a family curse? Did the blood spilled by Winchester rifles come back to haunt her? It's hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, Sarah Winchester spends 38 years building a house that only a ghost could love. Bizarre? Well, uh, don't forget this is California we're talking about. You know, apart from the curse, what I find incredible is finding a building contractor who's willing to work overtime. If you want proof of the supernatural, you get it right there. Dr. Shelley Kerr is a clinical hypnotherapist who specializes in the supernatural. I believe in cursed objects. I believe in cursed places such as the Winchester house. She believes it wasn't the victims of the Winchester rifle who placed a hex on Sarah, but the man she believed was saving her from it. I believe she was cursed 
initially by the psychic who she met in Boston. Her discomfort with the family business combined with her grief made her very susceptible to the message that the psychic gave her. Care thinks Sarah's nightly seances unleashed supernatural forces beyond her control. I believe she was speaking to many of the people who were killed by the Winchester rifle. She basically invited them in by believing what the psychic told her. Once inside, the spirit slowly took over Sarah's life and gradually drove her out of her mind. She created a vortex and the spirits were coming through telling her how to build the house. And I believe at that point, they began tormenting her. Did the psychic's reckless advice start the lifelong haunting of Sarah Winchester? Sarah had an awful life. She became completely isolated from society. She never went out. And her only communion was with a bunch of spirits. She literally was going mad. And it must have been really painful. If Sarah was my client, she would have to come in. And somehow, I would, I would have to work with her until she changed her internal belief system. And she believed that it was possible that she was not responsible for what happened to people who were killed by Winchesters. Assuming that she could get to that place, then she would allow somebody to come into her home in which case a spiritual cleansing of that home would have to take place. Once the cleansing takes place though, my guess is the level to which she opened up the door to the spirit world in there, in my personal opinion, is so profound that I don't think, I don't think she could continue to live there. Dr. Kara thinks this story didn't end with Sarah's death. She believes she is still living in Winchester House, along with the ghosts. She is still haunting her own house She's stuck there. It seems that she can't get any peace, even in death. Did Sarah invite malicious spirits into Winchester House through her seances? Did the ghosts drive her insane? Or is there another, more earthly explanation? I believe that Sarah Winchester was poisoned. A woman builds a strange and sprawling mansion in the California countryside. Was she haunted by a family curse? Did malicious ghosts drive her mad? New York University toxicology professor Judith Zelikov doesn't buy it. She has a simple medical explanation. I don't think that there were really ghosts there. I believe that Sarah Winchester was poisoned by the fumes and the dust of the metals that were produced in her house during the construction time. Back in the turn of the century, lead was used for almost everything. It was thought of as the magic metal. There was lead-based paint. And so all of the paint that they used in the house and they kept using in the house probably contributed to her increase in lead levels. Zelikov thinks Sarah was continuously exposed to toxic levels of lead in Winchester House for years. By sleeping in there, by bathing in there, by drinking in there, she was getting exposed to lead and many of these other metals constantly on a 24-hour-a-day basis. Was Sarah being slowly poisoned by lead? Could this account for her madness? The key, says Zelikov, is lead's ability to concentrate in the brain, where it damages critical neurological functions. Lead affects a specific part of the brain called the limbic system, and it also affects these chemicals that are produced by the brain. We have serotonin, which is the happy neurotransmitter and makes you smile, and then you have the other neurotransmitters. We know that lead can affect these neurotransmitters. We know that it can reduce the serotonin and increase the dopaminergic, and that can lead to things like delusions, paranoia, and obsessive compulsive behavior. Lead gets to the brain very easily in the soft tissue, and it can kill your brain cells, and it can impact in different areas of the brain. Professor Zelikoff believes Sarah's strange compulsions are evidence of lead poisoning. It seemed to me that she was of a very high anxiety and hyperactive behavior in the way she had to get those houses done and never, never, ever stopped. That could all be accounted for by high blood lead levels. Were Sarah's strange behavior and ghostly obsessions caused by lead poisoning? Sarah Winchester biographer Mary Jo Ignafo doesn't think so. The historical evidence indicates that Sarah Winchester was not insane. 
She's also sure stories of Sarah Winchester's strange behavior and supernatural obsession are all nonsense. I don't believe Sarah Winchester was cursed. I think she was a woman living life how she wanted to live her life. But if Sarah wasn't mad, why did she spend nearly 40 years constructing a giant, maniacal house? Simple. Sarah needed a lot of living space. When she first came to California, all of her sisters and their families came with her. So initially, her intent was to build a very large residence to accommodate uh, a couple different families. She enjoyed and loved and admired architecture, and she spent her time and her money exploring architecture and interior design, not only in her San Jose house, but her other five houses as well. That house was her hobby house. And so it was like Sarah Winchester's canvas. And she would say, I would like this built here. And she would instruct her builders to build it. And then she would say, oh, I don't really like that. I think you need to take it down and let's redo it this way. Oh, no, I don't like that. And so she kept going on that course for many, many years. But does this explain why Sarah built twisting hallways and doorways to nowhere? Ignafo reveals that they were never intended to be part of the original design. They were the result of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which caused severe damage to Winchester House. She built a tower that reached to seven stories, and that tower tumbled in the earthquake in onto the house, and she lost the top three floors of her house. According to Ignafo, Sarah ordered her workers to close off all the affected stairs and doorways. So if Sarah wasn't cursed and wasn't crazy, why all the speculation about her life? All the negative stories that started to come out about Sarah Winchester in the press came out at exactly the same time that the American conscience started to acknowledge atrocities visited on Native Americans. Because Sarah Winchester's money comes from the arms industry, that seems to make her more of a target. Was Winchester House born of a family curse? Or was it inspired by its owner's mental illness? Or was it just a flight of fancy for a woman with more money than architectural sense? Weird. Or what? So, there we have it. Stories of curses from around the world. In Britain, a mysterious painting is linked to a rash of home fires. Does the crying boy bring fiery destruction wherever he goes? In Florida, a sinister toy brings misfortune down on the unsuspecting. Can Robert the Doll destroy your life? And in California, a mysterious house bears witness to a family's dark past. Is Winchester House cursed by ghosts? Are these strange stories proof that curses are real? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?